Hi everyone, today I will be reading to you chapter three and four from the book Hatchet. So chapter three goes like this. Going to die, Brian thought, going to die, gonna die, gonna die. His whole brain screamed it in the sudden silence, gonna die. He wiped his mouth with the back of his arm and held the nose down. The plane went into a glide and very fast, a very fast glide that ate altitude. And suddenly there weren't any lakes. All he'd seen since they started flying over the forest was lakes, and now they were gone. Gone. Out in front, far away at the horizon, he could see lots of them. Off to the right and left more of them, glittering blue in the late afternoon sun. But he needed one right in front. He desperately needed a lake right in front of the plane, and all he saw through the windshield were trees. Green death trees. If he had to turn, if he had to turn, he didn't think he could keep the plane flying. His stomach tightened into a series of rolling knots and his breath came in short bursts. There, not quite in front, but slightly to the right, he saw a lake, L-shaped, with rounded corners, and the plane was nearly aimed at the long part of the L, coming from the bottom and heading to the top. Just a tiny bit to the right, he pushed the right rudder pedal gently, and the nose moved over. But the turn cost, cost him speed, and now the lake was above the nose. He pulled back on the wheel slightly and the nose came up. They caused the plane to slow dramatically and almost seemed to stop and wallow in the air. The controls became very loose feeling and frightened Brian, push, making him push the wheel back in. This increased the speed this increased the speed a bit, but filled the windshield once more with nothing but trees and put the lake well above the nose and out of reach. For a space of three or four seconds, things seemed to hang almost to stop. The plane was flying, but so slowly, so slowly, it would never reach the lake. Brian looked out to the side and saw a small pond, and at the edge of the pond, some large, a large animal. He thought a moose standing out on the water. Also still looking, so stopped, the pond and the moose and the trees, as he slid over them now, only three or four hundred feet off the ground, all like a picture. Then everything happened at once. Trees suddenly took on detail, filled his whole field of vision with green, and he knew he would hit and die, would die. But his luck held, and just as he was to hit, he came into an open lane, a channel of fallen trees, a wide place leading to the lake. The plane, committed now to landing, to crashing, fell into the wide place like a stone, and Brian eased back on the wheel and braced himself for the crash. But there was a tiny bit of speed left, and when he pulled on the wheel, the nose came up, and he saw in front of the blue of the lake, and at that instant, the plane hit the trees. There was a great wrenching at the wings as the wings caught the pines at the side of the clearing and broke back. Ripping back just outside the main braces, dust and dirt flew off the floor into his face so hard he thought he must have, there must have been some kind of explosion. He was momentarily blinded and slammed forward in the seat, smashing his head on the wheel, then a wild crashing sound ripping of metal, and the plane rolled to the right and blew through the trees, out over the water and down, down to slam into the lake, skip once on, the, on water, as hard as concrete, water that tore the windshield out and shattered the side windows, water that drove him back into the sea. Someone was screaming, screaming as the plane drove down into the water. Someone screamed tight animal screams of fear and pain, and he did not know what it, what it was, that it was his sound, that he roared against the water that took him, and the plane still deeper down in the water. He saw nothing but since blue, cold blue green, and he raked at the seatbelt catch, tore his nails loose at one hand. He ripped at it until it released, and somehow, the water trying to kill him, to end him. Somehow he pulled himself out of the shattered front window and clawed up into the blue, felt something hold him back, felt his windbreaker tear, and he was free. Tearing free, whipping, ripping free. But so far, so far to the surface, and his lungs could not do this thing, could not hold and wore through and he sucked water took a great pull of water that would finally win finally take him and his head broke into light and he vomited and swam pulling through no pulling without knowing what he was what he was doing without knowing anything pulling until his hands caught at weeds and muck and pulling and screaming until his hands caught at last in the, the grass and brush and he felt his chest on land he felt his face in the coarse blades of grass and he stopped Everything stopped. A color, color came that he had never seen before. A color that exploded in his mind with the pain, and he was gone.
gone from it all, spiraling, spiraling out into the world, spiraling out into nothing. Nothing. The memory was like a knife cutting into him, slicing deep into what him with hate. The secret. He had been riding his 10 speed with a friend named Terry. They had been taking a run on a bike trail way and decided to come back a different way, a way that took him past the Amber Mall. Brian remembered everything in incredible detail, remembering the time on the bank clock in the mall flashing 331, then the temperature 82 degrees, 82, and the date. All the numbers were part of the memory. All of his life was part of the memory. Terry had just turned to smile at him about something, and Brian looked over Terry's head and saw her. His mother. She was sitting in a station wagon, a strange wagon. He saw her, and she did not see him. Brian was going to wave or call out, but something stopped him. There was a man in the car. Short, blonde hair the man had, wearing some kind of white pullover tennis shirt. Brian saw this and more, saw the secret, and saw much more, but the memories came in pieces came in scenes like this. Terry smiling, Brian looking over his head to see the station wagon, wagon, and his mother sitting with the man. The time and temperature clock, the front wheel of his bike, the short blonde hair of the man, the white shirt of the man, the hot hate slices of the memory were exact. The secret. Brian opened his eyes and screamed. For seconds, he did not know what he, where he was, only that the crash was still happening and he was going to die. And he screamed until his breath was gone. Then silence, filled with sobs as he pulled in air, half crying. How could it be so quiet? Moments ago, there was nothing but noise, crashing and tearing, screaming. Now quiet. Some birds were singing. How could birds be singing? His legs felt wet, and he raised up on his hands and looked back down at them. They were in the lake. Strange. They went down in the water. He tried to move, but pain hammered into them, into him and made his breath shorten into gasps, and he stopped, his legs still in the water. Pain. Memory. He turned again, and sun came across the water. Late sun cut into his eyes and made him turn away. It was over then, the crash. He was alive. The crash is over and I am alive, he thought. Then his eyes closed and he lowered the head, his head for minutes that seemed longer. When he opened them again, it was evening, and some of the sharp pain had abated. There were many dull aches, and the crash came back to him fully. Into the trees and out onto the lake, the plane had crashed and sunk into the lake, and he had somehow pulled free. He raised himself and crawled out of the water, grunting with pain of movement. His legs were on fire, and his forehead felt as if someone had been pounding on it with a hammer. But he could move. He pulled his legs out of the lake and crawled on his hands and knees until he was away from wet, soft shore and near a small stand of brush of some kind. Then he went down, only this time to rest, to save something of himself. He lay on his side and put his head on his arm and closed his eyes because that was all he could do now, all he could think of being able to do. He closed his eyes and slept, dreamless, deep, and down. There was almost no light that he opened his eyes again. The darkness of night was thick, and for a moment he began to panic again, to see, he thought. To see is everything, and he could not see, but he turned his head without moving his body and saw that across the lake the sky was a light gray, that the sun was start, starting to come up, and he remembered that it had been evening when he tried when he went to sleep. Must be morning now, he mumbled it, almost in a hoarse whisper, as the thickness of sleep left him, the world came back. He was still in pain, all over pain. His legs were cramped and drawn up, tight and aching, and his back hurt when he tried to move. Worse was a keening throb in his head that pulsed with every beat of his heart. It seemed that the whole crash had happened to his head. He rolled on his back and felt his sides and his arms moving away slowly. He rubbed his arms. Nothing seemed to be shattering or even sprained all that badly. When he was nine, he had plowed his small dirt bike into a parked car and broken his ankle had to wear a cast for eight weeks, and there was nothing like, nothing now like that, nothing broken, just battered around a bit. His forehead felt massively swollen to the touch, almost like a mound over his eyes, and it was so tender that when his fingers grazed it, he nearly cried. But there was nothing he could do about it, and like the rest of him, it seemed to be bruised more than broken. I'm alive, he thought. 
I'm alive. It could have been different. There could have been death. I could have been gone. Like the pilot, he thought suddenly. The pilot in the plane, down in the water, down in the blue water, trapped in the seat. He sat up, or tried to. The first time he fell back. But on the second attempt, grunting with the effort, he managed to come to a sitting position and scrunch sideways with his back until his back was against a small tree where he sat facing the lake, watching the sky get lighter and lighter with the coming dawn. His clothes were wet and clammy and there was a faint chill. He pulled the torn remnant, remnants of his windbreaker, pieces red, really, around his shoulders and tried to hold what heat his body could find. He could not think, could not make thought patterns work right. Things seemed to go back and forth between reality and imagination, except that it was all reality. One second he seemed only to have imagined that there was a plane crash, that he had fought back of the sinking plane and swum, swum, swum to shore, that it had all happened to some other person or in a movie playing in his mind. Then he would feel his clothes wet and cold and his forehead would slash a pain through his thoughts, and he would know it was real, that it had really happened, but all in a haze, all in a haze world. So he sat and stared at the lake, felt the pain come and go in waves, and watched the sun come over and the end of the lake, over the edge of the lake. It took an hour, perhaps two. He could not measure time yet and didn't care for the sun to get halfway up. With it came some warmth, small bits of it at first, and then the heat came, clouds of insects, thick, swarming bodies, hordes of mosquitoes that flocked to his body, having a living coat, made a living coat on his exposed skin, clogged his nostril when he inhaled, poured into the mouth when he opened it to take a breath. It was not possibly believable. Not this. He had come through the crash, but the insects were not possible. He coughed them up, spat them out, sneezed them out, closed his eyes and kept brushing his face, slapping and scrunching them by the dozens, by the hundreds. But as soon as he cleared a place, as soon as he killed them, more came. Thick, whining, buzzing masses of them. Mosquitoes and some black flies he had never seen before, all biting, chewing, taking from him. In moments, his eyes were swollen shut and his face puffy and round to match his battered forehead. He pulled the torn pieces of his windbreaker over his head and tried to shelter it, with, but the jacket was full of rips and it didn't work. In desperation, he pulled his t-shirt up to cover his face, but that exposed the skin of his lower back and the mosquitoes and flies attacked the new soft flesh of his back so viciously that he pulled the shirt down. In the end, he sat with the windbreaker pulled up brushed with his hands and took it, almost crying in frustration and agony. There was nothing left to do. And when the sun was fully up and heating him directly, bringing steam off his wet clothes and bathing him with warmth, the mosquitoes and flies disappeared, almost that suddenly. One minute he was sitting in the middle of a swarm, the next they were gone, and the sun was on him. Vampires, he thought. Apparently they didn't like the deep of night, perhaps because it was too cold, and they couldn't take the direct sunlight. But in the gray time in the morning, when it began to get warm and before the sun was full up and hot, he couldn't believe them. Never in all the reading and all the movies he had watched on television about the outdoors, never once had they mentioned the mosquitoes or flies. All they ever showed on the naturalist shows was beautiful scenery or animals jumping around having a good time. Nobody ever mentioned mosquitoes and flies. Uh-uh. He pulled himself up to, the stand, to stand against the tree and stretched, bringing new aches and pains. His back muscles must have been hurt as well. They almost seemed to tear when he stretched. And while the pain in his forehead seemed to be abating somewhat, just trying to stand made him weak enough to nearly collapse. The, the back of his hands were puffy and his eyes were almost swollen shut from the mosquitoes. And he saw everything through a narrow squint. Not that there was much to see, he thought, scratching the bite. In front of him lay the lake, deep, blue, and deep. He had a sudden picture of the plane, sunk in the lake, down and down in the blue with the pilot's body, still strapped in the seat, his hair waving. He shook his head, more pain. That wasn't something to think about. He looked at his surroundings again. The lake stretched out slightly below him. He was at the base of the L, looking up the long part with the short, with the short part out to, the, to his right. In the morning light and calm, the water was absolutely perfectly still. 
he could see the reflections of the trees at the other end of the lake. Upside down in the water, they seemed almost like another forest, an upside down forest to match the real one. As he watched a large bird, he thought it looked like a crow, but it seemed larger, flew from the top, real forests, and the reflection bird matched it, both flying out over the water. Everything was green, so green it went into him. The forest was largely made up of pines and spruce, with stands of some low brush smeared here and there, and thick grass and some other kind of very small brush all over. He couldn't identify most of it, except the evergreens, and some leafy trees he thought might be aspen. He'd seen pictures of aspens in the mountains on television. The country around the lake was moderately hilly, but the hills were small, almost hummocks, and there were very few rocks except to his left. There lay a rocky ridge that stuck out overlooking the lake about 20 feet high. If the plane had come down a little to the left, it would have hit the rocks and never made the lake. He would have been smashed, destroyed. The word came, I would have been destroyed and torn and smashed, driven into the rocks and destroyed. Luck, he thought, I have luck. I had good luck there. But he knew that was wrong. If he had been, if he had had good luck, his parents wouldn't have divorced because of the secret. And he wouldn't have been flying with a pilot who had a heart attack. And he wouldn't be here where he had to have good luck to keep from being destroyed. If you keep walking back from good luck, he thought, you'll come to bad luck. He shook his head again, wincing. Another thing not to think about. The rocky ridge was round and seemed to be of some kind of sandstorm with bits of darker stone layered and stuck into it. Directly across the lake from it, on the inside corner of the L, was a mound of sticks and mud rising up out of the water a good eight or ten feet. At first, Brian couldn't place it, but knew that he somehow knew what it was, had seen it in films. Then a small brown head popped, in, up, popped to the surface of the water near the mound and began swimming, swimming off down the short leg of the L, leaving the v, a V of ripples behind, and he remembered where he'd seen it. It was a beaver house, called a beaver lodge, and especially he'd seen on the public channel. A fish jumped. Not a large fish, but it made a big splash near the beaver. And as if by a signal, there were suddenly little splops all over the sides of the lake, along the shore, as fish began jumping, hundreds of them, jumping and slapping the water. Brian watched them for a time, still in a half daze, still not thinking well. The scenery was very pr pretty, he thought, and there was... There were new things to look at, but it was all a green and blue blur and, blur, and he was used to the gray and black of the city, the sounds of the city, traffic, people talking, sounds all the time, the hum and whine of the city. Here at first, it was silent, or he thought it was silent, but when he noticed, when he started to listen, really listen, he heard thousands of things, hisses and blurks, small sounds, birds singing, hum of insects, splashes from the fish jumping. There were great noise there was great noise here but a noise he did not know and the colors were new to him and the colors and noise mixed in his mind to make a green blue blur that he could hear here is a hissing pulse sound that he was still tired so tired so awfully tired and standing had taken a lot of energy somehow had drained him he supposed he was still in some kind of shock from the crash and there was still the pain the dizziness the strange feeling he found another tree, a tall pine tree with no branches until the top, and sat with his back against it, looking down on the lake, with the sun warming him. In a few moments, he scrunched down and was asleep again. That's the end of chapter four. I'll be back tomorrow with chapter five.